This morning I get to introduce Zach Can to you. Uh, Zach and his wife Cassidy, their two kids, Jude and Oliver, will be traveling back to Papua New Guinea May 1st. And if you've been around Grace Bible Church very long, you know Zach and Cassidy. They really need no introduction. But I do want to introduce Zach in this way. There are approximately 7,000 languages in the world. And if you break that up into some dialects that can't communicate with each other, it could be said that there are 10 to 14,000 languages in the world. Of those 10 to 14,000 languages, some 600 and change have the Bible in their language. I don't know how many versions of an English Bible you possess of the 440-some English versions of the Bible. But the numbers here are staggering. The peoples of the world need God's Word. It's not something everybody can do. It's a tall task requiring much sacrifice and great skill. And those who seek to move their families to another part of the world to learn a language, in some cases a language that nobody else in the world speaks but the host language, to write an alphabet for that group and teach the people to speak and write their, or to teach the people to write and read their own language, and then to translate the scriptures into that language so that the gospel can be heard, so that God may be known, so that the church may be built. It's a tall task, requiring heroic effort. And Zach and Cassidy are normal people taking on a heroic endeavor. God said that it is beautiful feet to take the good news of God to the people who need to hear. So Zach is going to bring us good news from God's word, and you'll get to hear him and then pray for them as they go. Zach, come on up. Well, this is a wonderful opportunity for me to get to thank you guys on behalf of Cassidy and Jude and Oliver and myself. I just want to say thank you to Grace Bible Church for how you've cared for us on this furlough. Uh, We've been back for about six months now. Most of that time has been spent here worshiping with you guys and your guys' hospitality that you've shown us, the generosity uh, that you've given to us has just blessed us so much. And, and now we're on the tail end of our time here uh, in the States. We're heading back on May 1st, as Smed said. And if you look at your calendars, that means that after this Sunday, we officially have only two Sundays left with you. Um, so just thank you guys for that. And thank you to the elders, uh, the pastors here, for giving me an opportunity to preach God's word to you. Uh, Back in January, we had an opportunity, our team had an opportunity to present on what we're doing in Papua New Guinea. Uh, That's what you, you you send us to Papua New Guinea to preach God's word, and today you're giving me an opportunity to practice that on you. So you guys are going to be guinea pigs this morning. I'm not going to preach in dough. I don't think I can do that yet anyway. Um, But thank you guys so much, and uh, I just want to Thank the Lord, because really he is the one who has done all these things. So would you pray with me as I thank him? Oh, Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this opportunity to look at your word now. God, none of us would be here. This church would not exist. Our mission would not exist had you not revealed yourself in your word. And you've done so in a language that we can understand. You have raised up men to translate your word, so that we can have it in our language and we can hear the good news. The good news that even though we were dead in our sins, you in your great mercy can make us alive in Jesus Christ. God, I pray that that good news would be true of every single person here. Whatever our circumstances were that we walked into this room with, God, I pray that you would meet us and speak to us through your word now. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
This morning we're going to look at one of Paul's letters. It's his second letter to the Corinthian church. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I love this passage of scripture. I'm so glad I got to choose whatever passage I wanted. Uh, This passage speaks of the comfort that God gives in the face of trials and suffering. Uh, This is especially true for people who labor to serve Christ. Uh, For us on the mission field, uh, we, we have faced lots of trials. You sent us out three years ago as three families to Papua New Guinea, and we had a plan. We had a, a, a number of steps that we wanted to take to, to bring the gospel uh, to the Doe people, and, and our plans have changed many times. We have faced uh, massive conflicts uh, in our ministry in Papua New Guinea. We've faced cancer uh, that took Matt Dodd last year. Uh, we're facing delays with work permits for the Mitchells. And, and, and we're trying to do good. We've got a, a mission that we think is worthy and we're excited about. And yet, our plans get disrupted. And it's so good to know that that does not take God by surprise. Um, and you don't have to be a missionary for this to apply to you. You don't have to be Zach Can or Wayman Lee uh, Some of you are moms and dads, and you have little kids in your home. And you're praying that they too might know the gospel. And they see all the flaws in your life. They see all the ups and downs in your family. And you're trying to convince them that God's word is true. I remember as a kid, my mom praying for me in my presence that God would save me and use me to preach the gospel and if necessary to die. And uh, I remember sitting there, I don't know, I was probably playing with Legos or something in the living room, and my mom's over there on the couch praying, God, make Zach a martyr. You know, man, it's a a weighty prayer. Any moms or dads pray those kind of prayers for your kids? Uh, And if you do, how do you get them to believe that it's worth laying down their very lives for Christ? How do you convince your kids? How do you get them to believe Psalm 63.3, which says the steadfast love of the Lord is better than life? If you're a small group leader, how do you get your small group to trust the words of Jesus when he says, he who wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and die? This message is the opposite of the American dream. It's counterintuitive to our way of thinking, And so how do you do it? How do you get people to believe in the good news of Jesus, especially those who could care less about what you have to say? And I love that this situation does not take the Bible by surprise. The Apostle Paul, everywhere he went, he was a missionary, everywhere he went, he's trying to convince people of the good news, that there is rescue from the wrath of God by God through the death of the Son of God on their behalf. And you would think if anyone is able to convince people, it's the Apostle Paul, right? God met him on the road to Damascus. Paul has performed many miracles in his ministry. Uh, Even in this letter, he is writing the very words of God. If anyone could convince people, you would think it's Paul. And yet you get to books like this, 2 Corinthians, a letter written to a church that is disillusioned with Paul and his message. Even though Paul first brought the gospel to the Corinthians, uh, you can read about it in Acts 18, they've been drawn away by seeds of doubt that have been planted about Paul's worthiness as a minister of the gospel. His critics are saying things like what we find in 2 Corinthians 10.10, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech is of no account. Paul is suffering, and his message is remarkably unpopular. And that's the setting for this letter. 2 Corinthians was written to woo back this flock in Corinth. Paul is jealous for them. Not so much that they would esteem him, but that they would worship God and trust in their Savior. And so what, Paul is, what, what is Paul going to do to pursue his wayward children? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to read uh, the first seven verses to give us some context, but we'll spend most of our time looking at the core of his argument in verses 6 and 7. 
So read with me. 2 Corinthians 4, starting in verse 1. Therefore, having this ministry, by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, he has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. God, again, I pray that you would do what I cannot do in these moments. I pray you would save those who do not yet know you and that you would encourage those who are weak and weary in the midst of the ministry and circumstances that you have placed them in. None of us are sufficient for these things. But help us to know in the core of our being that sufficiency does, in fact, come from you. God, help us as we look at these verses, I pray. Amen. In these verses, Paul is wooing his wayward church with his own personal hope that he has in the gospel. He is saying that unlike them, this is verse one, unlike them, he is not discouraged by the ministry that God has given to him. He is not tempted to take the good news of Jesus and make it more pleasant or more palatable. It's verse two. In fact, verses three, four, and five Uh, The plight of mankind is so dreadful, and he realizes that. The plight of mankind is so dreadful that he dares not point to himself, Paul, as if there's any hope to be found there. And then as you follow his train of thought down to the core of his argument, you get to verses 6 and 7. And now in some of your translations, uh, verses 6 and 7 are often set apart. Verse 6 belongs to one paragraph, verse 7 to another one, and they've got... The translators have put a nice little title in there for you. And that's, that's great. That's useful. But today I'm going to ask you to just mentally erase that gap and bring verses 6 and 7 together. Uh, we're going to look at the core of Paul's argument, the, the foundational hope that he has for why he continues in this ministry that seems so fraught with plans that are not working out and suffering that keeps coming up. And I've, I've summarized his main point for you. I'll put it up on the screen here. The main point that Paul is going to make in these verses is this. God alone makes God known. God alone makes God known. This is the most foundational hope that Paul has for his own ministry and for the Corinthians. Only God can reveal who he really is. God alone gives people what they need. And what they need is him. So let's, let's see this in, in the text this morning. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God is the subject of that sentence three times. And depending on what translation you have, it might be harder to see, but basically, literally, it says, for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, that one has shown. Three times, God is the subject of this hopeful sentence. So there's no mistaking who is doing the work here. It is God and God alone who is doing the shining. And God is not, the only, God is not only the one doing the action, but God is also the end of the action here. God has shown in order to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, that 
is a little bit of a mouthful. But as we learned from Scott last week, God's word is not unclear. We just need to work patiently and prayerfully to know what he has plainly said. God has shown light, is what it says. And this is not the same light as what he created in the beginning when God shone. It's not particles and waves. Uh, This is a light that contains knowledge, light of knowledge. And notice some distinct features about this knowledge. It's not mere head knowledge. It's not mere head knowledge. Look where this knowledge takes place. God has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge. This is the kind of knowledge that impacts the heart. It's not a mere fact. It's not something that we study and then regurgitate for a test. It's something that deals with the affections, the core of a person. Just to give you an example of this, I remember studying in physics class in high school the concept of gravity. And I had to memorize a bunch of equations and the acceleration, uh, I had to look it up again. Here it is, 32 feet per second per second. Uh, So when you jump out of an airplane or go bungee jumping or drop an object, it's falling at 32 feet per second per second. All right, write that down, pass the test. It's head knowledge, it's there. But I remember, uh, I went bungee jumping once. And I remember when when you jump off that structure that you're tethered to and you feel the weight, uh, the force of gravity pulling you to earth, that's a different kind of knowledge. That's, that's, That's a knowledge that changes you. And that is the kind of knowledge that I think Paul has in view here. This is a different kind of knowledge. It's not mere head knowledge. It's a knowledge that happens in the heart. And notice the content of this knowledge. It's knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's a knowing who God is and what he has done. And if you look back at the parallel of this in verse 4, it says, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So this light of knowledge is light of the gospel. This is the good news that Jesus came to rescue sinners. This is the good news that you don't have to die for your sins. Someone else has done that for you if you will believe in him. So to sum up, God is shining to give knowledge of himself. God is the giver and God is the gift. And verse 7 affirms this, even though God is not the subject of this next sentence. The point is the same. Paul writes, we, that's Paul and Timothy at least, per the first verses of 2 Corinthians, maybe some of his associates as well, we have this treasure in jars of clay. And the reality here is really simple. Clay jars do not fill themselves, right? They have to be filled by something else. And we know from its connection to verse 7, God has shown this light of the gospel in our hearts so that we have this knowledge of the glory of God and we have this treasure, pointing back to that. We have this treasure, what God has done, what he has shown us, we have this treasure in jars of clay. So God is the giver and God is the gift. And so that is the good news. That is the comfort for us this morning is that God and only God can and does make himself known. And according to our text, he does so in two ways. First, God alone makes God known by enlightening the blind to know him. It's verse six. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now to see how great this news is, you have to see how terrible the bad news is first. The good news of verse six is given in stark contrast to the bad news in verse 4. In verse 4, we're introduced to the case of those who are perishing. Paul writes, The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light 
of the gospel of the glory of Jesus, who is the image of God. And notice the two dreadful realities of the people that are described here. First, they are blinded by the devil. The God of this world or the God of this age, he has a time to deceive the nations. And he is blinding people to the truth. And second, notice the kind of people that he is blinding. Notice that they were unbelieving and perishing to begin with. Satan is not blinding neutral people. People who just don't know yet where they stand uh, on God and his salvation. People are rebels. So that is doubly dreadful news. People do not believe in God and they are aided on the path of destruction by a supernatural enemy. That is the bad news for all of us. If we do not have Christ, we are blind to the goodness of God. We don't see it. We rebel against it, we leave it, and we have an enemy who's more than willing to help us on that way. And notice what it is that Satan wants to keep you from seeing. Blindness to what? Satan does not want you to see the light of the good news of the glory of Jesus who is the image of God. So the very thing that God is shining forth in verse six is what Satan does not want you to see in verse four. The God of this world does not want you to see God. So if you're ever wondering, what, what are the schemes of Satan and his hordes? What, what do they want to accomplish more than anything else? What they want to accomplish is not your discomfort, they are planning your ultimate demise, that you would not see God and enjoy him. Satan does not want you to see the truth that God is delightful. Psalm 1611 says, God makes known to me the paths of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. But Satan does not want you to see that. He doesn't mind letting you see pleasures in other things. Pleasures in leisure, pleasures in vacation, the pleasure you get when you get those likes and thumbs up and smiley faces and affirmations on social media. He doesn't mind if you take delight and pleasure in those things. What he does not want you to do is to take delight and pleasure in God. That is bad news. And if we're going to see people rightly, we're going to see that this is the condition that we all start in. From the clerk at the store to the person sitting next to you in the pew to your kids at home, all of us initially are faced with this blindness. And if you're a parent or a missionary and your job, your duty is to proclaim good news and try to help your church family, your kids, your audience to hear and understand the good news of God. And when you hear that this is their condition, that they are blind and they have a supernatural enemy helping keep them that way, that can be discouraging. But it's interesting to note that Paul is not discouraged in chapter four. Look at what he says in verse one. We do not lose heart. And then again, if you look down to verse 16, same chapter, he says, so in light of everything I've just said, again, we do not lose heart. This whole chapter is bookended with hope. He is not discouraged that people are in such terrible trouble because he knows the cure for such a dreadful diagnosis. In contrast to the God of this world, the God of this age in verse four, Paul writes in our text today, the God who made the world to begin with, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, he is the one who is doing a new thing. He is creating a light in the hearts of people who do not see him yet. And in pointing to this God of creation, Paul is pointing to God's uniqueness and his ability. God is unique. God and Satan are enemies, no doubt about it. God and Satan are enemies, but they are not equals. God is the creator. Everything else 
including Satan and people and light, are created. God is in a class all by himself. So much so that even those mysteriously wonderful creatures that we see in Isaiah's uh, vision, you know, the ones that have six wings, and when they speak, the ground itself shakes. Uh, If we saw one of those creatures, we would be like, whoa, that is the most unique thing I have ever seen. But what do these creatures say when they're standing in the presence of God? They say, holy, holy, holy is Yahweh. He is other. He is unique. And God is capable. Creation shows that. There was once no light. And God made light. God commanded that light be, and it was. And the God who can do this can also do the work that is needed to cause people to be born again with new eyes that can see and treasure the delight that God is. And could anything be more comforting for us this morning? We need to know God. And on our own, we can't, we won't. But God, being rich in mercy, can and does enlighten blind eyes to see him. So though Paul's audience is discouraged by Paul's sufferings and his weaknesses and the fact that his plans haven't worked out, he wanted to come see them, but he's been prevented. He wanted to preach the gospel in Macedonia, but for various reasons he wasn't able to. And he's just met with some trials, some troubles. He can't accomplish some of the things that he had planned. Uh, But Paul is not discouraged. Though his audience is, Paul is trying to show them, I am not discouraged. Because Paul realizes that it's not ultimately about Paul and what Paul can do. It's about God, and he can do anything. This is the reason Paul does not lose heart in the midst of suffering and rejection and unpopularity. He is not tempted to leave this good news Because there is nowhere else to go. God who creates something from nothing is the only one who can create belief where there is none. Sometimes it helps to see an example of of what this is like. You hear the theological truth, but you wonder, how does this end up playing out? What does it look like for someone to go from being totally blind and rejecting God to seeing his great worth? And one of my favorite examples of this, and you don't have to turn there, you can if you want, is in John chapter 6, towards the end. Uh, In John chapter 6, if you're familiar with it, towards the beginning, you have this great crowd that is uh, following uh, Jesus. But Jesus is not fooled by their approval. Jesus knows why this crowd is there following him. They want a king, and they want this king to give them bread to eat. Uh, But instead of feeding them again, Jesus tells them what they really need. He says, I am the bread of heaven. I am what you need. So that's the choice. Jesus, the creator, do you want me, Jesus, the creator, or do you want a created thing like bread? And at the end of John 6, it says this. After Jesus said these things, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. They chose, created things over their creator. They they just didn't see, they didn't have eyes to see how delightful God is. But then look at what happens next. Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, To whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. That is an awesome answer. Now, how did a Galilean fisherman get it? How did he get it? Did he read the right books? Did he diagram the right sentences in just the right way? Jesus' next words tell us why Simon can see this. Did I not choose you? The 12. What makes Peter different from the crowds? The answer is is that Jesus chose him. And in Matthew's account of this 
same event, Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. God can and does overcome blindness. God alone makes God known by enlightening us to see him. That's the first way that God makes himself known. But God's self-revelation does not end there. He not only enlightens the blind to know him, but he entrusts the weak to show him. That's number two. We see this in verse seven. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Paul here is addressing that criticism that we looked at there that yeah, we looked at at the beginning where the Corinthians are wondering why should we believe in your gospel and follow you when you are so unimpressive you are not a very good spokesman Paul for the church and think about it when we choose people to be spokesmen for our products who do companies like Nike choose they don't choose the weak things of the world to promote their product. They choose the strong and the fast and the capable. So what's going on here? Paul was not the most talented teacher by Greek standards and add to that his rap sheet of suffering, which you can read in chapter 11. All this led the Corinthians to wonder if Paul really was the best spokesman to be following. And Paul's answer is verse seven. His answer is that God has shown in his heart to give the light of the gospel and he has this treasure in a weak, fragile, tongue-tied, unimpressive vessel for a very specific purpose. So that people will see that the astounding greatness of God's power is of God and not of him. There is a, a caution for the Corinthians here and a comfort for the Corinthians here and for us as well. And the caution is this. <clears throat> There's a danger when we start to put our hope and trust in a clay jar. The Corinthians are listening to these other speakers and they have some pretty plausible arguments and some pretty convincing reasons for why they should be following them and not Paul and maybe tweaking the message of Jesus to make it a little more pleasant and palatable for the masses. And we can face the same tension ourselves, right? We can, is how easily we can put a man or a woman in a place of, of where we start to put our trust in them. Where we're, where we're so glad that they're on our side thinking that somehow they make the gospel more appealing. Or perhaps it's a political figure and we think, oh, if we could just get a Christian into the right office, things would be so much better. There's a danger there. There's a caution. When we start to think that big, popular, rich, politically powerful, or theologically robust people can help the cause of Christ, we lose sight of the most important thing, and that is that Jesus is the help. We're the needy ones. He is the one who helps us. Politicians, pastors, celebrities, they cannot save you. In fact, they all need the same salvation that you do. Make no mistake, every single human being on this planet is a jar of clay. And when Paul says of himself and Timothy, we have this treasure in clay jars, in clay vessels, what he is not saying is that other people are actually made out of something better. Any more than Jesus in Mark 2, uh, when he spoke to the Pharisees, uh, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus is not saying, and I think we would all agree, that there is a single person who is actually well and not sick with sin and in need of the good physician. There's only the facade of people who think they have the righteousness they need to have peace with God. And similarly, there's not a single person who is not a clay jar. Only those who think they're a cut above the rest. 
So when God does save the rich and the famous and the well-spoken of this world, it's because he has overcome their blindness and shown them his glory. And when God saves the poor and the forgotten in the furthest corners of Papua New Guinea, it's because he has overcome their blindness and shown them his glory. There are only clay pots to save. So that's the caution. Don't think of yourself or others as anything other than a clay jar. But there's not just caution here, there's also comfort. And it's a comfort that we've looked at and proclaimed already, but we can't say it enough. There is a savior for fragile sinners. God made Jesus, who never sinned, to be sin on our behalf, so that we, who have only sinned, might have the righteousness of God. The comfort in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 is not, look at this clay and how awesome it is. That's not the comfort that Paul is giving to the Corinthian church. He's not saying, look at me, look at this clay. He's saying, look at this Christ. Look at this Savior that I have. Can you try to look past this crumbling shell to the treasure that is actually in there? Yes, I'm suffering. Yes, my plans have been foiled time and time again, but God has not failed. Look at this treasure, this good news that I have. Paul goes on to say uh, in the verses following ours, look at verse eight. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Clay jars don't have much hope of surviving that kind of treatment, being thrust down and crushed. But when a person has the forgiveness and the peace that Jesus purchased at the cross, our fearful fragility is turned into glory. That's what it says down in verse 17, for this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That's hope. And the hope doesn't end there in verse seven. God not only fills clay jars with the good news of his glory, he entrusts them to show it. God's use of broken, frail people to display his glory to the world is intentional and not accidental. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. God saves us and entrusts us for that purpose. It's not like God saves us and then puts us off to the side because he's ashamed of us. He actually uses us in our frailty to demonstrate his power and to reveal himself to the world. Now, how does this work for Paul in this letter? How do Paul's weaknesses and his frailty work to make God's power known? How does God get glory from having such a weak spokesman? There are lots of examples. I have four of them written down here. For the sake of time, we're going to do one. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at this with me. We're going to start reading in verse 8. This, is, I think, is a great example of what Paul means uh, when he's talking about that his weaknesses actually serves to put God's power on display. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. If Paul's trying to woo back this church that is disillusioned with him, that's not a very good way to start. Paul, we're struggling to accept you because you seem to be suffering. And Paul said, yeah, I am. To the point of death, I'm suffering. But there's a, there's a purpose for it. And look, look at what it says next. This is the end of verse 9. All this suffering, what, what was its purpose? But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. 
Paul's weakness and his suffering, his frailty, was to put on display that God is comforting even in the midst of those circumstances. So that when you are struggling and your life is hard and maybe your ministry is not accomplishing what you were hoping that it would, you can look to these verses and and remember, oh, God is capable. He has done this so that even in that worst of possible circumstances, God can still be my comfort. So now just some points of application for us. What are clay jars to do? If it's God alone who makes God known, what what is there for us to do? Well, got a couple things for you. One is know the good news of Jesus. Do you have a knowledge of God that leads you to worship him, to treasure him, to trust him? If not, then what you have, what knowledge you have of God is only knowledge and it's not the gospel. It's not. You can know all about God. The question is, do you love him? Have your affections been changed such that you see his glory and you love him and you trust him? If you would say, you know, I don't love God this morning, then I would plead with you to pray that God would show you himself, his great love and his grace. These verses say that God delights to do that very thing. He is capable. He is capable to save you. And if you do know the good news, of Jesus, then the other thing you can do, number two, is show that Jesus is good news. Show it in the way you live. Show it in the way you pray. Like my mom did, right? She knew she couldn't make a missionary or a willing martyr out of me, so she prayed, God, do what I cannot do. You can show it in the way that you preach by not adding or removing anything from the gospel. You can't decorate Christ to make him more appealing. To add something to Christ is really to take something away from him. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 4, 2, right? We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. So if you're an elder or a deacon or a small group leader, or if you teach in children's ministries, or if you're a husband or a father or a mother, Here is one massive way that you can honor God and give him glory. Don't tamper with what he said. You can show that Jesus is good news in the way that you suffer. Grace Bible Church, you are no stranger to suffering. This last year has held a lot of heartache and loss. And my prayer for you is that in whatever station we find ourselves, that we would be able to hope with joy in the salvation of our God. There was a missionary named Darlene Rose, a young missionary who got caught up in the horrors of World War II. She set out to share the good news of Jesus with natives on the island of Papua New Guinea, but ended up spending uh, four years in a Japanese prison camp. Not what she set out to do. And was God sufficient for her? Indeed he was. So much so that she could sing this hymn from her cell. She sang, He giveth more grace when burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. And when we have exhausted our store of endurance and our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we've reached the end of our hoarded resources, the Father's full giving has only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Now, if you do this, If you have eyes to see God's glory and you trust in his goodness and his grace, then when things are good and everything is peaceful in your life, you won't be distracted by the praise of man or the pleasures of wealth. God will shine forth as your sufficiency. And when you are suffering, 
and things are hard and your enemies are many, you won't be discouraged because God will shine forth as your sufficiency. And as you live here, those who are witnessing your life, they will see your confidence in God and it will make God look great. And it will comfort your soul. God, I pray that you would be our comfort and our salvation. God, help us to realize that when all we have is Christ, we have all we need. Help our hearts to sing with the psalmist, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God, help us to believe that. God, save us and put your greatness on display through us, I pray. Amen.